Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Authors and Their Journey series today, featuring Susan Schillinglaw presenting her book, A Journey into Steinbeck's California. I know you're in for a wonderful treat today. Uh, we um, all have enjoyed Steinbeck's books throughout the years, and this will be a wonderful afternoon for you. Um, in order for you to all have wonderful Zooming um, opportunities, I'd like you to please mute yourself. We are recording the program um, so that we can put it on our YouTube Pasadena, thanks to Susan very much. There's also live transcript if you would um, like to set that up yourself. Um, there is chat, and at the end of the program, Susan will answer chat questions for us. So if you could please put your questions into chat. So um, we have a copy of the book. You can see the wonderful cover on um, your computer right now, but we have a copy of the book in the Pasadena Library for you to um, reserve and check out. We have also have a copy of On Reading, The Grapes of Wrath by Susan um, Schillingworth. Chilling Law, uh, excuse me. So if you'd like to place a hold on those, and I'm sure they are available also at Romans Pasadena to purchase. So Susan was born in Iowa, raised in Colorado, and she graduated with a BA from in English and Art from Cornell College and earned a PhD in English with the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Since 1984, she's been a professor of English at San Jose State University, where she was director of the University Center for Steinbeck Studies for 18 years. In 2012 to 13, she was named the San Jose State University President Scholar. From 2015 to 18, she was director of the National Steinbeck Center in Salinas. Dr. Schillinglaw has published wildly on John Steinbeck. <laughs> Most recently, Carol and John Steinbeck, Portrait of a Marriage, and On Reading the Grapes of Wrath that we have in the Pasadena Public Library, and A Journey into Steinbeck's, Steinbeck's California that she's talking about today. In addition to numerous scholarly articles and edited texts, she also wrote introductions to several of Steinbeck books for Penguin Classics editions. Currently, she's working with the Western Flyer Foundation, helping to develop educational programs that reflect Steinbeck and Ricketts holistic perspective for the boat's relaunch in 2022. She is also co-editing a volume on Travels with Charlie for the University of Alabama Press. So you can see that Susan is extremely busy and we are very fortunate to have her join us today at the Pasadena Public Library. Welcome, Susan. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to um, speak in Pasadena. I wish I were there in person, but um, that will come soon, I hope, um, for all of us that we can travel more. Um, <clears throat> so today I want to talk about my book and, and both Steinbeck's journey, writing about California and my own, compiling this book um, because it's dear to my heart. The first edition came out in 2006 and the most recent um, edition in 2019. So um, I, as I was telling um, others beforehand, uh, this was a, um, a book that came about because an editor approached me and said, um, we're starting a new series about authors um, and artists in place and what that means to write in place. Um, and I was a Berkeley Press and she wanted to start with Steinbeck because he, so of course he's a kind of quintessential writer of place and of California and of defining place. So I eagerly accepted um, and that's how the book came about. about. Um, <clears throat> there's the recent edition has a different color. I kind of like the fact that the light has changed and it's autumnal now, but um, so I suppose in the third edition, you're happy that it survived um, for three editions, uh, but it, uh, it's uh, basically an illustrated introduction to Steinbeck country, to Steinbeck's biography, to Steinbeck's book. Um, and why he's still such an important writer 
um, I think, in the 22nd century. So um, I want <clears> to <throat> talk first about, and I suppose this is um, my interest has always been um, in both literature and the arts, because I was an art and English major. But the cover uh, painting was done um, by a local artist, David Laguerre, whose interests really tally with Steinbeck. So he was eager to have his paintings um, on both of the covers. Um, and he writes about the pastoral um, impulse and how he's inspired by the pastoral look of the Central California landscape. And he says, nature in the past, oh, he didn't say this, but he writes about this. In the pastoral equation is an embodiment of nobility, a trusted value against which we are invited to weigh our own experiences of culture and society. And basically David has spent his career looking at this sort of golden light um, and this kind of settled landscape of Central California. And that's essentially what Steinbeck was doing as well. He was looking at not a <clears throat> places, not just a backdrop, but places where people lived, where they worked, um, where they raised families. So his books are always about place, people, animals, flora and fauna, weather, water use, etc. All that is involved in place and landscapes in Steinbeck's vision. Um, so this is the actual cliffs that David Laguerre painted and Steinbeck um, wrote about uh, in one of his books. But the first part of this <clears throat> talk, I want to talk about books and just the physical book, because whenever I pick up this little book, A Journey into Steinbeck's California, I, it feels good. Um, it feels, uh, I, I like the I like the, the shape of it, the size of it, and the color photographs. And Steinbeck wrote about books. Um, it's interesting because when he was young, he, uh, he talked about um, going to the library and seeing the brilliance of books in the library. I love that phrase, brilliance of books. And he wrote a, lo a lovely little essay called Some Random and Randy Thoughts on Books, um, which I um, very much like, and I thought I would <clears throat> quote a bit from it. So you can just think about a book and the, um, why, um, why the physical book is important. And he uh, says uh, that this is the age of the package. American books constitute packages. And I imagine the same books, rules which apply to pill boxes and canned food must apply to books. For myself, I like the whole theory of the 25 cent book. He wasn't a book collector, <clears throat> but his editor was. It's wonderful today that even with all the competition of records of radio and television of motion picture, the book has kept it precious character. A book is somehow sacred. No other form save music can so invite the mind and the emotions. And no other form save again music invites the participation of the receiver as a book does. Now participation was a really important word for Steinbeck. He wanted readers to participate um, in the actuality of, <clears throat> of the book um, as um, an active reader. That was very important to him. A book should feel good in the hand and glad in the eye. And just a quick survey of some of Steinbeck's early books and how they do gladden the eye because his, his prose is so vivid and so much about place and so f the physicality of place that a lot of illustrators have been inspired um, by his books. Um, Tortilla Flat, which was published in 1935, he was living in, <clears throat> um, in Monterey at the time or in Pacific Grove. And uh, it was a book that had been rejected by many publishers and then suddenly it was accepted. It was his first commercial success, but here's the cover of the 1935 edition. Um, and then it was reissued in 1947 by um, Steinbeck's editor, Pascal Covici, who I, as I said, loved um, beautiful books. And it would, had, um, uh, 17 paintings done by a woman named Peggy Worthington, uh, who was the wife of someone at Penguin. But so much of what she captures in these paintings are um, captured as well in Steinbeck's prose. For instance, that little, <clears throat> that little picture of, this, of the saint 
is there's what it looks like today. Um, so it's right outside of San Carlos Cathedral in Monterey. So Steinbeck really wrote about what he saw um, and recorded it vividly. Uh, here's the passage from Tortilla Flat. They walked side by side along the dark beach toward Monterey <clears throat> where the lights hung necklace above necklace against the hill. A sand dune crouched along the back of the beach like tired hounds resting and the waves gently practiced at striking and hissed a little. It's a beautiful description. Um, and I think that's why people are drawn to this journey through Steinbeck's California, certainly why I was. Um, here's the Red Pony illustrated by Wesley Dennis. He also illustrated all the um, Margarito Henry, uh, Marguerite Henry books, um, Misty of Chincoteague, et cetera. Uh, so he illustrated the Red Pony. And Covici, again, a lover of books, published copies of the Red Ponies, limited editions. Uh, and again, this description that <clears throat> Steinbeck can um, uh, captures so much place. Um, and this again is the Salinas Valley. In the gray quiet mornings when the land and the brush and the houses and the trees were silver gray and black, like a photograph negative, he stole toward the barn past the sleeping stones and the sleeping cypress tree. The turkeys roosting in the tree out of the coyote's reach clicked drowsily. The fields glowed with a gray frost-like light and in the dew, the tracks of rabbits and of field mice stood out sharply. So I love the fact that he mentions a photograph here and Steinbeck was aware of, you know, seeing of the sharp eye of looking closely. Um, <clears throat> the Pearl published um, in, on, in the, well, it was published in the um, ladies, first in the Ladies Home, Home Journal in the mid 1940s, but it, it was illustrated by Orozco, a um, Mexican artist, and he did four illustrations for it. Um, beautiful line drawings. And then of course the Grapes of Wrath, <clears throat> um, has this magnificent cover um, and which really captures the whole of the novel, the notice, the notion of the journey, of it being a family book, of it tracing the path of the migration, much like the, um, the wagon trains that came west, the allure of the Blue Mountains. Um, it was done by a man named Elmer Hader, um, who was a fairly well-known um, uh, California painter. It actually came up for auction about 20 years ago for $75,000. I so wanted to buy it for San Jose State, but there wasn't state money for a painting. Uh, hard to do. And then the Limited Editions Club did the, uh, an edition of The Grapes of Wrath a year after its publication in 1939, and Thomas Hart Benton was the illustrator. This alliance between artist and writer is one of the happiest and wisest has been affected in the annals of American illustrations. Now I begin with illustrations in Steinbeck's books just to kind of emphasize the importance of the book. I think how it looks, how it feels, um, what kind of illustrations are there. And to kind of pay homage to this association that Steinbeck had with his editor, uh, <clears throat> basically from 19... Uh, 36 until the end of his life in 1968. They were very, very, very close. Well, Kovici died slightly before that, but. Um, and what uh, Pat wrote to Steinbeck on his birthday one year, I should be with you today on your birthday because I shall always be glad that you were born. And if I should leave before you, which is reasonable, I shall convince St. Peter to give me a hand press to work with you. And when you come, you will write little stories you always wanted to, and I shall hand print them and distribute them and thus corrupt heaven. What a lovely tribute to author and I think their collaboration and their love of books. So I wanted to begin with the physical book and um, then I wanna to turn to <clears throat> the writing of the book and how I kind of put this book together um, and why I was drawn to it. I wrote it <clears throat> after I'd been working at the Steinbeck Center at San Jose State. They have a large collection of Steinbeck. And um, I had just resigned. I'd done it for 18 years. I'd 
edited, I um, sponsored conferences, I published a newsletter, and I wanted to do my own writing. And as I said, this um, editor of a new um, press came to me and said, would you write about Steinbeck in place? And she said, can you write it in a year? And I'm gonna have you write a chapter a month. So I set off um, to the places that Steinbeck lived in Northern California and started writing the book. <clears throat> but I also had to answer the question of why is a sense of place so important to this writer? And what does that sense of place mean? And why is place-based writing um, so important? Um, so important to us in the West, so important to us as readers of American literature. Um, so Steinbeck, who was born in 1902 in Salinas, California, was very aware of place um, because he, nobody had written about his place, his swath of California. If you think about <clears throat> California writers in 1902, I mean, people would have known Jack London, they would have thought of Mark Twain's Roughing It um, in his time in California, um, <clears throat> Jack London, uh, perhaps, although he wrote a lot about, you know, Alaska, he also wrote about California, but there were, um, uh, Frank Norris had written about the railroad, but really nobody had written about um, Steinbeck's California, the Salinas Valley, stretching from Moss Landing <clears throat> to, um, you know, south to, you know, really Paso Robles. Um, and, uh, he says in East of Eden, where he wanted to really organize the book initially um, on, by the whole idea of the river moving through the Salinas Valley. And he writes in the opening, the Salinas Valley is in Northern California. It's a long narrow swale between two ranges of mountains and the Salinas River winds and twists up the center and it falls at last into Monterey Bay. Um, so that was his home territory, and he wanted to put it on the map. He wanted to become a writer um, at the age of 14, really very young, um, because he um, was determined to make his, his home turf um, uh, available to the world. Here's what he said in 1933 <clears throat> um, when he wrote to his publisher. He says, my country is different from the rest of the world. It seems to be one of those pregnant places from which come wonders. I was born to it and my father was. Our bodies came from the soil. Our bones came from the limestone of our own mountains and our blood is distilled from the juices of this earth. I tell you now that my country, a hundred miles long and about 50 wide, is unique in the world. Well, <clears throat> Um, this certainly is a um, tribute to the beauty of um, Northern California, but he had to lie um, in that because his father was not born in California. His father was born in Florida. He moves his father out to California, I think, just so that he can show this is, this is my inheritance. This is what I was born to write because I'm so much a part of the California soul and, you know, in, in body and soul. But it wasn't quite true, but nonetheless, that's how he felt about it. Um, <clears throat> here is the Red Pony Ranch, um, which is uh, right outside of Salinas that he evokes so beautifully um, in that, that short story. And this, this passage gives you a sense of what place means to Steinbeck. Um, it's, uh, I think, the, sh the short stories in the Red Pony Cycle, there are four stories, or some of his best writing, his best early writing. Um, and he says, the hills were dry at this season and the wild grass was golden, but where the spring pipe filled the round tub and the tub spilled over, there lay a stretch of fine green grass, deep and sweet and moist. Jody drank from the mossy tub and washed the bird's blood from his hands in cold water. Then he lay back on his back in the grass and looked up at the dumpling summer clouds. By closing one eye and destroying perspective, he brought them down within reach so that he could put up his fingers and stroke them. He helped the gentle wind push them down the sky. It seemed to him they went faster for his help. One fat white cloud, he helped clear the mountain rims and pressed it firmly over out of sight. Jody wondered what it was seeing then. He sat up the better to look at the great mountains. 
where they went piling back, growing darker and more savage until they finished with one jagged ridge high up against the west, curious secret mountains. Now that's of course fine description and it's very specific, um, but also suggestive. Um, and this is true of Steinbeck in all of his prose that um, it's not just the physical description, but there's a kind of symbolic quality to it as well. So that, you know, the tub becomes a place of refuge for um, Jody, a place of retreat, and the mountain ranges that do <clears throat> lie in the Salinas Valley, the coastal range um, as described here, and um, uh, the Santa Lucia's, uh, and then the Gabalans to the east, he makes those kind of two points of reference, the dark forbidding mountains where um, he feels that they're full of secrets and the unknown. Um, he wrote a short story in which he says there are dark watchers in the mountain. In the East of Eden, he sets up these two ranges of mountains as suggesting good and evil. They have all these symbolic qualities to them. So you have the Santa Lucias and then you have the Gabalans. The Gabalans were jolly mountains with hill creases, hill ranches in their creases, and with pine trees growing on the crests. <clears throat> People lived there and battles had been fought against the Mexicans on the slope. He looked back for an instant at the great ones and shivered a little at the contrast. So those contrasting value of the mountain ranges is, is really what, what makes Steinbeck's landscapes so compelling because it's not just a description of you know, a backdrop, it's the, um, it's the spiritual and uh, symbolic quality of the landscapes. It's also um, very compelling as you read. One of his most famous stories collected in a volume called The Long Valley is um, the chrysanthemums. And it, <clears throat> the, in the opening page, it reads the high gray flannel, um, flannel fog of winter closed off the Salinas Valley from the sky and from all the rest of the world. On every side, it sat like a lid on the mountains and made of the Great Valley a closed pot. On the foothill ranches across the Salinas River, the yellow stubble fields seemed to be bathed in cold, pale sunshine, but there was no sunshine in the valley now in December. I mean, that sets up the whole story, which is about a woman who feels trapped, feels like she's in a closed pot of a marriage, and yet the, the glimmers of hope she sees outside of the confines of the ranch, suggested by the cold pale sunshine and the yellow stubble fields. So <clears throat> it's not insistent symbolism, but the imagery is always suggestive in Steinbeck and always sets up patterns of meaning um, that really amplify and make the, the stories much, much richer. Um, in an early review, and one of my favorite reviews, I actually edited a selection of Steinbeck reviews um, early in my career. Um, but one of my favorite reviews, because I think um, this LA Times critic really got it right, um, reviewing the Long Valley collection in 1938, these short stories said, behind each story, inside it and surrounding it, there was a presence a fragile presence, but with a surprising strength in that borderland story of this world and the mind's world and maybe another world. That really says it all, that, that's right on. This world, the mind's world, and maybe another um, world. Whenever I read John Steinbeck, I'm in the presence of a man. That's a feeling I've had only at rare intervals during my 25 years of book reviewing p &H. That's quite a tribute. Um, so um, I think, you know, when Steinbeck set out to write early on, he wanted to tell the story of his valley, but it was a story of people who were often cut off, lonely, um, set apart workers, um, people who are ordinary people. Um, so you can see that in this statement, I'd like to write the story of this whole valley of all little towns and farms and ranches and the wilder hills. I can see how I'd like to do it so that it would be the valley of the world, but that'll have to be sometime in the future. Again, that stretching beyond just the physical description of the valley to give it um, far more um, weight and profundity and um, meaning. And of course, he 
all this culminates in East of Eden, um, the book that he wanted to write for the 15 years prior to his actually sitting, setting down to start it in 1948. Um, but it's, you know, one of his great novels and uh, it was finally published in 1952. When he started writing it, he said, I'll make my country as great in the literature of the world as any place in existence. I keep the tone of Salinas in my head like a remembered symphony, which is a lovely tribute to his hometown. Um, and then of course, this is the Salinas River, uh, which was to be the organizing principle actually of East of Eden when he started writing it because he spent a lot of time by the river and it's one of the, <clears throat> um, the only subterranean rivers, or it used to be before it was dammed, that some ran both above ground and below ground. And that seemed so much about what he was trying to do in East of Eden, talk about um, the evil, the darkness we all had within us, and yet the lighter qualities that showed on the surface. So again, the river was gonna be another, one of these kind of symbolic features of the landscape that Steinbeck was gonna explore. So <clears throat> moving on, I also want to talk about place um, in a, uh, some of the places that I wrote about um, in the book. Um, and of course, Salinas is the one that demanded a lot of my attention because he was born in Salinas. And so a hometown always sort of shapes a writer, I think in important ways. And certainly it did um, Steinbeck. So to grow up in, in Salinas, uh, certainly shaped his vision of place and of people um, and of power dynamics. Uh, so this is his house. Um, it's now a luncheon place where you can go to have a delightful lunch. Um, they, the inside remains exactly as it was when Steinbeck was there. So you can um, eat in the parlor or the dining room. Um, and uh, of course it's uh, redecorated. It's a lovely spot. And he loved his house. So born in 1902, as I said, he was very close to his parents who were readers. His mother had been a school teacher. His father was a businessman. And he had two older sisters and one younger sister. Um, and they were very tight knit. Um, his second wife said they were clannish. Um, <clears throat> she felt left out. So that's why she uses the word clannish. But they were a very close knit family. And I think it's important um, to see that because so many of Steinbeck's books are about um, creating families. Um, and what does a family mean? And what is a close knit family? So many of his books are about alternative families. Um, Lenny and George and their dream ranch that um, attracts so many people and of mice and men. Or in East of Eden, you have Adam Trask, his two boys, and Lee, the Chinese servant, surrogate, surrogate mother, surrogate father, surrogate father. Um, you have Tortilla Flat and the Friends, or Canary Row and the Friends that create houses. So the idea of home was something he keeps coming back to, the Jodes and the Grapes of Wrath. They're looking for home and what does home mean and what does family mean? And that's partly this inheritance from growing up in Salinas with his own very close-knit family. But Salinas proper, um, he didn't like at all. So he rebelled against the town rather than his family. Um, he said in an essay he wrote about his hometown in 1955, he said, Salinas was never a pretty town and we knew it. Um, so here it is growing up and he, he, didn't, he didn't like the social structure of Salinas is really what he didn't like. He didn't like the hierarchy of wealth in this, in this valley, which has some of the richest agricultural land in all of California. So there's incredible wealth in Salinas. There's more wealth in Salinas even today than there is in say Carmel. And we all think of Carmel as, you know, if you come to Northern California as a very wealthy town, but Salinas has far more money in land and water. And here's what he said about his, home, um, his hometown, which I think is revealing of his whole career. Um, he kept this idea of um, the problem with hierarchical structures. 
<clears throat> he said, the social structure of Salinas was a strange and progressive one. First, there were the cattle people, the first families of the Salinas Valley, gentry by right of being horsemen and dealing in gentry's goods, land and cattle. Theirs was an unassailable position, a little like that of English royalty. Then Klaus Spreckels came from Holland and built a sugar factory in Caps, and the flatlands of the valley around Salinas were planted to sugar beets, and the sugar people prospered. They were upstarts, of course, but they were solvent. The cattle people sneered at them, but learned, as every aristocracy does, that not blood, but money is the final authority. Sugar people might never have gotten any place socially if lettuce had not become the green gold of the valley. Now we had a new set of, set of upstarts, lettuce people. Sugar people joined cattle people in looking down their noses. Those lettuce people had carrot people to look down on. And those in turn felt odd about associating with cauliflower people. Now that sense of hierarchy and power versus powerlessness is really um, became one of his central themes in his work. If you think about, again, of Mice and Men, The Grapes of Wrath, um, <clears throat> his sympathies and his empathy were always with the powerless, um, the people who did not own this wealth, um, this great land and um, uh, cre create, uh, they created so much wealth in the valley. Um, and so many of his books are about people who work in their, with their hands because that's what he would have seen growing up. People working in the fields. This is um, the sugar beet factory, uh, the Spreckles sugar beet factory in Salinas. They um, built irrigation ditches for the sugar beets um, to thrive. Um, and this is, these are the kind of scenes he would have seen growing up. Later, he said, the thing that arouses me to fury more than anything else is the imposition of force by a stronger on a weaker for reasons of self-interest or greed. That arouses me to a fury. It's the one unforgivable thing I can think of. And that's a short-handled hoe. So I think of the legacy of growing up in Salinas are this, you know, this empathy for ordinary people, um, the dignity of work, the <clears throat> resistance to the powerful who exploit the powerless. Um, a, a strong sense of home and place and that nature sustains more than, you know, all the things that happen in the town. Uh, and much of this you see in his books, like Of Mice and Men. <clears throat> I love this cover where you see George and Lenny so small against the landscape, dwarfed by their circumstances. <clears throat> I also want to talk a little bit about um, why Steinbeck, I think, is so popular today um, in the 22nd century and popular because of his vision of place and of landscapes. He was really an ecologist, very consciously so. He used the word in the 1930s when very few people were using it. Um, but he saw humans not as um, controlling nature or controlling place or in charge of place, but as another species, another animal living in place. And so he tends to see humans as um, uh, a part of the whole ecosystem of a place. Words that sound familiar to us now, but not so much in 1930. The book I love, and I always begin my courses in Steinbeck with this book, is To a God Unknown, which was his <clears throat> third novel published, but his second to be written. His first was a, a kind of uh, rollicking sort of fairy tale type story called um, Cup of Gold. But his second and his first California book was To a God Unknown. So in writing my own book, A Journey into California, um, starting with California, I love nothing more than to go to um, the San Antonio mission, which is the setting for this book. Um, and one of his friends said, we were living that time in a wounded organism and it was gonna get a lot worse by war, but it was an organism and we saw it as an organism, as a living whole, a thing that was more than the sum of its parts, which is very much concerned John. Nature is an animal, a whole animal, and we are part of that animal. And here in John's words, and this is Mission San Antonio, he said, 
Each figure is a population and the stones, the trees, and the muscled mountains are the world, but not the world apart from man, the world and man, the one inseparable unit, man and his environment. Why they should ever have been understood as separate, I do not know. <coughs> now he wrote that in 1932, as he was writing this book to a God unknown, set uh, a mission San Antonio, which is a wild and wonderful place. It's actually used to be Hearst's hunting lodge was right near this mission. And so the acres remained pristine and it's now owned by the US government. It's uh, military training grounds. So it's remained pristine. So I urge you to stop if um, you haven't seen it because it's, it's just a wonderful place. And you really get a sense of what Steinbeck was trying to, trying to get at um, <clears throat> with this one inseparable unit, man and his environment. Um, Steinbeck went here in 1918 um, when he, he was recovering from the flu epidemic. He'd had to have a rib um, uh, removed so that he could breathe, so he almost died. And his doctor sent him to a warmer climate and that's how he happened to be at Mission San Antonio and that's where he set this book. Um, which is about a really interesting book about um, both uh, a settler who comes to California, flourishes, and then his whole enterprise is destroyed by drought. So Steinbeck is also um, read today or kind of examined today as one of the sort of an eco warrior, one, one very much aware of the story of the West as a story of water use. And um, that's what this book is about, drought and how drought affects both people and the land. Um, <clears throat> and here's the, what it looks like today for Hunter, Hunter Liggett. Joseph gained, gained the ridge top and looked down on the grasslands of his new homestead where the wild oats moved in silver waves under a little wind. The clouds were massing in the sky. And you can, take, you can read the book and take pictures or just simply appreciate the vision which hasn't changed at all in a hundred years. His eyes followed the water scars up the hills to the dry springs and over the unfleshed mountains. Again, it's a book about drought and the terrible consequences of drought. And it's also about how place, um, it's landscape, it can be images and symbols, but it's also, um, there's a spiritual element to um, nature in this novel that's very, very powerful. Um, <clears throat> the endless green halls and aisles and alcoves seem to have meanings as obscure and promising as the symbols of an ancient religion. Um, and that's actually the title comes from the Vedic hymns. So he was aware of nature as having a kind of spiritual quality to it as well. Um, and that's what this holistic embrace of humans, animals, plants, um, weather, nature um, really meant. And look at the cover of this book. Um, <clears throat> the, one of the characters sa says at one point in the book, um, she says, the people and the hills and the earth, all, everything except the stars are one and the love of them is strong like a sadness. Now look at this cover, which looks like the mountains, the coastal mountains, but is really a man as a mountain. Um, it's, and that's kind of what the book is about. Humans trying to be as powerful as nature. Um, so you have the hero of the book portrayed as a mountain. It's, it's a very, very interesting book. And finally, um, I think if we think about Steinbeck country and Steinbeck's California, it really does go beyond Salinas and the Salinas Valley. And um, he lived in Los Gatos up um, in Silicon Valley and wrote um, The Grapes of Wrath in, Sol in Los Gatos. So I wrote a chapter about that. Of course, he traveled to Bakersfield to, um, to uh, investigate migrant conditions for the Grapes of Wrath. So he moved up and down California. And I was saying ahead of time, he lived in Eagle Rock for a while um, in the late 1920s, early 30s. So he was really, <clears throat> although he focused um, his writing first um, on the Salinas Valley, he really 
spread out to kind of track what um, coastal California was like. Um, and but even before he, you know, wrote long before he wrote the Grapes of Wrath, he spent a lot of time in Monterey. And Monterey um, was, and the Monterey Peninsula was really as as much a part of his Central California experience as was Salinas, because his family had a summer home in um, Monterey, and he loved the ocean. Um, so he he um, loved water. And Cannery Row is the book, of course, that expresses um, his love of uh, coastal California. And again, this is such a complicated little book. It seems like just a funny little book about a bunch of bums who live on, Can on Cannery Row and about his friend, the marine biologist, Edward Ricketts, who has a lab on Cannery Row that you see right there in the middle of the, um, of the picture. But the first sentence says, suggests that this book about a place, um, Cannery Row, is far more than just you know, a funny book about a bustling place. Cannery Row in Monterey in California is a poem, a stink, a grating noise, a quality of light, a tone, a habit, a nostalgia, a dream. And I think that first sentence asks us to consider, well, how can it be all those things? Um, how can it be a stink, which is very physical, um, and a nostalgia, which is, you know, a memory? How can it be abstract and concrete at the same time? And that's the locale of you know, all of Steinbeck's fiction. That's both, it's both abstract, it's the poetic and it's the physical. And that's what, that's what Cannery Row does, um, gathers up and look at these covers and how different they are. And each one sees a different part of the, the landscape of the book, the kind of mystical, the realistic and the, and the suggestive. The, um, the um, Life magazine sent a photographer down to Cannery Row right after the book, after the book was published in 1945 and said, go photograph the real Cannery Row, see what it's like. And the photographer came back, his name was Peter Stackpole. Um, and he said, well, the real Cannery Row is exactly what Steinbeck wrote. Here are the bums. And he took a picture of Gabe in the book and the the palace pop house and the the um, the chicken walk where they went up and down the stairs and the <clears throat> this is wasn't take this picture wasn't taken by Stackpole but it's the um, madam in the book and she really you know she was had a brothel right across the street from Ed Ricketts lab Dora is a great woman a great big woman with flaming orange hair and a taste for Nile green evening dresses. So I don't have much time to talk about this friendship with Ed Ricketts, but I think it's important to think of, when talking about Steinbeck's la um, landscapes in this book that this friendship has got to be, you know, seen as a major part of Steinbeck's life, his writing life, and his attitude towards land and place. Because R Ricketts, a marine biologist, Steinbeck met him in 1930, uh, they were soulmates um, and they, they sparked one another, they inspired one another. Rickus was a scientist, a marine biologist, Steinbeck was a writer, um, a humanist, and they really came together so that their ideas meshed. Um, and they eventually wrote Sea of Cortez, uh, a trip they took together down to Baja in 1940. They eventually co-published Sea of Cortez in 1941, which was Steinbeck's own favorite book. But Ed Ricketts informs um, Cannery Row and whatever, everything Steinbeck wrote in Cannery Row. And indeed, the method in Cannery Row that Steinbeck articulates in the opening of the book is that, um, that sometimes stories are so delicate, like flatworms, that you have to pick up with a knife or else they cling to the rock. Um, so he's kind of telling you to read the story in a, in a biological, scientific way, but also to read it very carefully to participate. Um, so I don't have time to go into you know, detail really about the, this relationship, but it's been written about much more, um, many, many times in the last few years, and it's crucial to understanding Steinbeck's sort of um, scientific and appreciation and their collaboration, which was 
one of the most significant of 20th century literature, a scientist and a writer. And they lived very close to one another um, in Monterey. Uh, there's Ricketts Lab on the right, Steinbeck's little cottage summer, his family's summer cottage on the left. And they were in constant contact throughout all the 30s and wrote letters to one another um, until 1948 when Ricketts died. I think I'm gonna end there just because I, <clears throat> I don't wanna you know, go too long and not leave time for questions. So I will stop there and um, I think I have one more, two more slides I might say something about because this is Ricketts and you can see how much it's a shared um, notion with Steinbeck. Interrelation seems to be the pretty much the keynote of modern holistic concepts where the whole consists of the animal or the community um, in its environment, the notion of relation being significant. Now he's talking about intertidal communities because that's what Ricketts did, study intertidal communities. But Steinbeck studied human communities in the same way. Um, think of the grapes of wrath, um, the notion of a relation being significant. So that's just one example of how close their thinking was. Okay, so I want to end there so anybody has, has time to answer questions, but I hope I left you with the impression that the subject of Steinbeck's California and Steinbeck's landscapes um, and Steinbeck's sense of place um, is a rich and complex um, subject um, and delightful. So I will end there. Anybody have any questions? Thank you so much, Susan, for an absolutely fabulous program. I think we're all uh, want to go back and read Steinbeck's various novels mm -hmm. to see it from a different light and pick up things that we've all kind of missed. We all read them um, high school, college years, probably all wrote papers about them, <laughs> thought about them. Our children had to read them, especially The Red Pony. And um, I think we all just kind of want to go back and find um, the, read the books and find things that we've missed in them. Um, I want to remind everybody, if you check out the book, there's a wonderful timeline in, in um, a journey into Steinbeck's um, California that um, you can read starting in 1902, um, going up to 1966. So um, I will turn Absolutely. on my light so I don't disappear into a dark hole. Yeah, your timeline. And then if anyone wants to do further reading, your further reading is wonderful. And you have notes for every chapter. So, and as well as an index, it is a thoroughly enjoyable book. And I encourage everybody to get it and spend some time with it. Um, before we were starting the program, we did talk about the Pasadena Connection. Um, and Eagle Rock, and I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, did he write about going to Eagle Rock in one of his books? Um, <clears throat> he wrote a, um, no, he was, he came to Eagle Rock right after he had, he went to Stanford University and left Stanford in 1925 and then went up to Tahoe and tried to go to New York City. He was still kind of roaming around trying to find himself in the 1920s. So he, he came to Eagle Rock with his first wife to live. So they were gonna you know, find their fortune in Los Angeles. And he lived with his roommate um, and another couple in a tiny little house. And that was unsustainable. So finally they found, he and Carol found a house, um, newly married, they found a house in Eagle Rock and they spent hours cleaning it painting it and making it livable. And then the person, the landlord liked it so much, he kicked him out and put his um, son and daughter-in-law in it. So that's what happened to that. That's why they had to move back to Monterey. Oh, so it's better to get another home up there that he redid, because you just don't think of him redoing houses and painting it or... He was quite handy. He loved working with his hands. He loved carving, he loved wood carving. Um, he loved kind of inventing little things. And so uh, he, he has, you know, the very first thing Steinbeck wrote um, in the um, high school yearbook, it's probably his first publication, was about the importance of shop in high school and that every, every high school should have a wood shop. Um, so he, he did like, you know, working with his hands and 
No. Okay, and you kind of got that feeling of his writing about talking about the beauty of places and the land and what he saw that the people taking care of the land and growing mm -hmm. things on yeah, the, of, yeah, out there. Did, did so he ever grow anything? About, he was a gardener. He liked gardening. Um, the chrysanthemums is a story about a woman with planters' hands. You know, And, you know, if you think about Of Mice and Men, each character is defined by what he does with his hands. So he's very aware of, you know, working people and what they do physically um, with, with their hands. And, you know, he, he respected um, handiwork, so his own. So he wrote his first um, story for his high school yearbook. Did he? Well, no, that was, it was just a, it wasn't story. Really a story. It was just a, a column in the high school yearbook, yeah. Oh, okay, so he grew up with a, lots of books with his family. They were a to close group and they would read every evening. <laughs> they encouraged his parents were thrilled with the fact that he was writing and mm -hmm. supported him. And did he make much money from it initially? Well, his parents weren't exactly thrilled he was a writer because his mother wanted him to be a banker or a lawyer. That's why she urged him to go to Stanford. He didn't really want to go get a university degree. Um, so he took courses in English and creative writing and um, history. He liked history a lot, um, but he never wanted to graduate. So, um, and then his parents were supportive um, when he was determined to be a writer, his father admired his determination and his mother kind of saw that he wasn't going to become a banker. Um, so they were encouraging and they, you know, one of the stories I love the best is his father, who also liked to work with his hands, um, took his first book, which was Cup of Gold, and um, bound it in leather in the basement of their house. Um, so his oh. father would had a hobby of, you know, binding books and leather and he was very proud of his son for publishing a book. Yes you can see that for his father doing that um, and I can see no wonder he would be. His um, choice of words is is fabulous so how did he it was that those words are just within him his descriptive powers and what he saw or did he have a wonderful teacher or his parents growing up that made him actually open his eyes and well, um, see what he was seeing. He did write since about he it since he didn't like Salinas proper, um, and felt kind of out of place in the Salinas society, um, and the sort of moneyed hierarchical society. He spent a lot of time riding his pony. He had a red. He did have his own red pony around the fields of Salinas. So he loved nature. Um, he loved being outside, and I think. Um, you know, to have a childhood spent near the Salinas River, he, he hunted, he was in Boy Scouts, he, um, you know, had a pony. You notice the change of seasons, you notice insects and flowers. It's, it was the freedom of being outside and in nature that he, that he loved and it defined him. And so I think the descriptions are part of his, he often said he wanted to write with a child's vision. And I, that doesn't mean he wanted to write for children, but he, wants, he wanted to write with that clarity of seeing things precisely and clearly and with great attentiveness, um, or the word that I called attention to, participation. Um, so it's kind of like slowing down, really looking, the slow food movement, you know, really appreciate your food, really, <laughs> really right. like things, you know, so that's how he appreciated nature. So was he a painter? Did he paint any of these wonderful landscapes or? <laughs> no, primarily he, he wrote. He was, he wrote every day, you know, he loved writing and he loved words. Uh, he simply, he read one of his favorite books was the Boy's King Arthur that he read when he was nine, an aunt gave it to him. So he loved language, he loved words, the sound of words. He once said he knew so many words and use a few of them because his writing is pretty straightforward. Um, and he doesn't try to, he's not Faulkner for instance and in using this, you know, this obscure vocabulary, but um, he simply loved the sound of words. So he would, the, the rhythm of words. Um, he loved hearing speech. I think his, his novels are remarkable for having a purity of language and of conversation and of speech. Yeah, they absolutely are. There's. Um... <clears throat> 
where they really draw you into, you get that sense of the place and the people and you feel very um, involved with them. Right. To um, really become a part of it. So um, it's very poetic and very physical at the same time. Right. So, so he married Carol and then he left um, um, Eagle Rock, mm-hmm. Los Angeles, went back to Salinas. And then did he stay in Salinas? Did no, he, he, didn't, Monterey he, didn't or he didn't go back, Monterey? He didn't go back to Salinas because um, he really didn't like Salinas. He went to um, Pacific Grove, to that little summer house in Pacific Grove. So he lived, after he left Eagle Rock, um, and they were only there a few months, he went back to Pacific Grove. And, and his father let him use the house and gave him $50 a month to help support him so that he could, so that Steinbeck could, you know, realize his dream to become a published writer. And oh, so his, his parents really did support him very, very much to do that. Now he had siblings. Um, did, were they also writers or? Um, actually his younger sister um, to whom he was the closest, she was a very good writer, but, and she loved poetry and she was an English major at Stanford as well, but she didn't support herself as a writer. She just, um, Steinbeck was the writer in the family. Oh, so he wrote in these journals. Are those journal have those journals been published? Or uh, if they come to auction, they'd be quiet. Are they at some, really some, some library? Do you have them at San Jose or or That's where? A really interesting question. You know, some writers, all of their papers are in one place, um, <coughs> like Hemingway. So Hemingway's papers are at the Kennedy Library in Boston. Right. Um, but Steinbeck's papers are spread out across the country because his Stanford friends left all their letters um, that you know they had from Steinbeck. Um, they left them at Stanford. Uh, San Jose State has uh, an English professor wanted there to be a center at the university closest to Steinbeck's home. So she started the Steinbeck Center. So we have papers, the, um, the, the journal, for instance, he kept when he was writing those short stories, that's at, Stan- at San Jose State. Um, Salinas has, um, you know, materials from Salinas people. Um, he moved to New York City in the latter part of his life. And so the Pierpont Morgan has oh. Steinbeck collections because he worked there when he was trying to do a translation of Mallory, a modern rendition of Mallory. Um, Columbia University has papers because his agent was loyal to Columbia and then University of Texas has papers. So it just, there's major collections of Steinbeck all over the country. So if you want to do research, you've got to travel. So did you travel around to all of them and have a, a journey mm-hmm. around to everything? And that must I have did, been exciting. Yeah. Yes. Exciting to go through and actually look at them. Pretty yeah, I, lo- I love archives and I love to read um, in archival research and old newspapers and such. Could you, could you read his handwriting easily? How, how did he read it? Pretty, sometimes um, when he really wants to concentrate, his writing gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's very hard to read. There's one journal at the, at the Pierpont Morgan that's just incredibly difficult to read because his writing gets minuscule. And so, um, so but other journals not so much so you know his his writing is not easy to read but it's it's legible so how did he find his publishers once he wrote his book on these journal books then he would go to his publishers with them or he found a publisher that well, wanted only, it? was only, that difficult for him only, first of all only two of the journals are published the grapes of wrath journal is published okay as Working Uh, Days, and the East of Eden Journal is published. What about his books? He kept books as he was writing books. But he had several publishers um, early on, publishers that, you know, went bankrupt. And the editor that remained the most loyal had his own publishing company and Kovici Freed and published a couple of Steinbeck's books. And then his company went under during the depression and he joined Viking as an editor. So Steinbeck's publishers at the end of, or from 1938, from the, the Grapes of Wrath on to the end of the, his life were, was Viking, Viking Press. Huh. Now Viking Penguin, well now Viking Penguin um, 
who else? It's a conglomerate now, but um, a, a big conglomerate. Yes, yeah. exactly. A, a big. Well, we all had Penguin Classics. Yes. Chances exactly. are, in school at one <clears throat> period or time in college, that we would you would get Penguin Classics, and that's probably what my Steinbeck books were, and they were all in paperback. Yeah. Well, he still <laughs> all of his books are still published by Penguin, so they're still under copyright, so they're still published by Penguin. So are there any, I've been talking a lot and we've been having a lovely conversation. I don't see any, any questions in chat. Does anyone attending have any questions um, for Susan? It, it's just such a fascinating um, program. And I think we all want to go back and reread um, John Steinbeck and pick up what we've actually missed. Um, his, his wonderful sense of place and people and descriptions um, what would be the first book that we should start with? What would be the one that you, if you wanted to tell someone, we'll end with that, what was the book oh, to read of question. John Steinbeck's? Well, I think if you're revisiting Steinbeck, it's the short stories are fun to read. Um, so Long Valley, I think I, that, that's, those are really rich and interesting stories. Um, a Mice and Men is going to be made into a ballet, which is kind of, oh. so that, book that. that book is a is interesting he wrote it as a play novelette so he wanted it to be both a play and a novel and so that it could be performed on stage and also be a novel and subsequently it's been an opera um, a musical and now a ballet so his books have you know wide sort of currency in other genres that's fascinating. Well, thank you so much, Susan, You're welcome. for You're welcome. a wonderful, wonderful program. And I encourage everyone to check out from the library, A Journey into Steinbeck's California. We also have um, travels um, with John Steinbeck. Um, it's the um, on reading the, the Grape of Wrath. Um, the, no, the Grapes of Wrath, on reading the Grapes of Wrath. Right, yeah. Right, right. Thank you for the invitation. It's lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much. Good okay. Night. Take care.